Hi everybody, this is Gat Saad. Many people have asked that I uh, offer some comments regarding the recent guidelines that have come out uh, from the APA, the American Psychological Association, as relating to how to uh, conduct psychological uh, services when dealing with boys and men. Uh, it's a 36-page report, I believe. I'll provide you with the link if you wish to access the report, I'll put that in the description of this video. I very quickly went through the report, so I can't uh, claim that I've read every word of it, but I certainly looked at the 10 guidelines that they offer and got a pretty good sense of, uh, if you like, the, the, the biases inherent to the report. Uh, so, for example, I did some searches looking at things like how often the word biology is mentioned, right? We're dealing with men and boys as opposed to presumably women and girls. Of course, I realize that there are 873 genders, but not that notwithstanding, uh, other than them, them meaning the APA, throwing away things like, you know, there's a wide range of forces that affect men's behaviors, including sociocultural and contextual and the rest of this kind of nonsense, they usually throw in biological as a throwaway term, but they actually don't offer any biological-based theorizing when it comes to understanding uh, boys and men as compared and contrasted to girls and women. Uh, but words like privilege came up quite a bit. Words like socialization came up quite a bit. Uh, and of course, this is exactly what you would expect when you have a melange of social constructivism and identity politics. And for those of you who want to know a bit about sort of my scientific background as relating to these issues, I've, of course, published countless uh, you know, papers uh, wherein I've explored sex differences, whether it be in gift giving or mate search or uh, economic games, uh, looking at the effect of the digit ratio, which is a morphological trait um, linked to your fingers. Uh, you know, I've looked at the menstrual cycle, which of course applies only to women. Oh, I mean, of course, men too can menstruate. Uh, I've looked at the effects of testosterone on men when engaging in conspicuous consumption or wa when watching other men engaging in conspicuous consumption. So in other words, my career has been uh, very much uh, rooted in an exploration of sex differences, which of course makes perfect sense given that I'm an evolutionary behavioral scientist. Uh, but I've also looked at sex differences specifically in clinical settings or in psychiatric context, which is relevant to that particular report. So I've looked at, uh, I've published three papers in medical journals looking at suicide and obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and also at Munchausen syndrome by proxy, uh, where I, where the, the, the element of biological sex was uh, you know, a key feature in each of those papers. Uh, I won't get into all the details here, but I just want to give you sort of a bit of a background that, uh, you know, I'm very much steeped within uh, sex differences and, of course, the evolutionary and biological bases of uh, important sex differences. So with that perspective, uh, I then looked at the report to get a sense whether there is anything valuable in there. And there is actually one or two guidelines that are quite reasonable. But most of the stuff, as I said, is either a melange of social constructivism, which is it's all due to socialization. You know, why are men more likely to be incarcerated? Socialization. Why are they more likely to be violent? Socialization. Why more suicide? Socialization. So socialization explains everything. And as such, it explains nothing. And as I've previously explained, socialization itself is not an ultimate explanation because the question then becomes why are men socialized to be of that particular form and specifically to the extent that many forms of socialization happen in exactly the same way across cultures then it of course makes perfect sense that there might be some biological basis to why socialization forms uh, manifest themselves in the way that they do. But in any case, let me just spend a few minutes going through the guidelines. So here we go. Let me just read them. So guideline one, psychologists strive to recognize that masculinities are constructed based on social, cultural, 
and contextual norms. That guideline literally means nothing. Okay. Nothing. Zero. It has zero meaning. It has zero actual. I mean, of course, one's masculine identity, whatever that means, is shaped by social, cultural, and contextual norms. Uh, of course, again, as I said, masculinity is constructed in the way that it is precisely because of biological reasons, right? There are no women who prefer men that possess pear-shaped bodies, who speak with a high-pitched voice, who are pathologically lazy, and who cry at the uh, sight of a cockroach while sucking their thumb in a corner in a fetal position. So masculinity has a biological basis that's actually invariant across social, cultural, and contextual settings. But even if we concede that social, cultural, and contextual settings matter, so what? That's like saying psychologists strive to recognize that masculinities are constructed via the inhaling of oxygen. It means nothing. Next, psychologists strive to recognize that boys and men integrate multiple aspects to their social identities across the lifespan. Uh, or this is also known as bruh, men are complicated creatures. No kidding. Uh, I do incorporate multiple, what is it? Multiple aspects of my identities. When I was a teenager, I was a young uh, hormonal soccer player and then when later I became a serious graduate student and later I became a, a, a loving father and so as we go through life stages uh, we take on new roles we take on new identities we didn't need this guideline to tell us this and, it, and this is that statement is not specific to men it is specific to only every single human being who's ever existed on earth Three, psychologists, okay, this is where the, uh, the social uh, justice warrior stuff comes in. Guideline three, psychologists understand the impact of power, privilege, and sexism on the development of boys and men and on their relationships with others. No comments. Maybe this is what explains why across every racial group, and every educational attainment level, women outnumber men in American universities. That's a lot of sexism right there. Four, psychologists strive to develop a comprehensive understanding of the factors that influence the interrelationships of boys and men. I mean, this is simply saying that humans are social creatures, and so it is, it is important to understand the manner by which interrelationships are formed, maintained, forged uh, for boys and men. But that's also true for girls. Now, of course, uh, sociality might express itself in somewhat different forms when you're talking about uh, same-sex groups of boys versus same-sex group of girls and so on. By the way, all of these things are evolutionary-based uh, mechanisms. They don't just come about mysteriously through the uh, magic of culture and socialization. So again, from a actionable perspective, to say that psychologists strive to develop a comprehensive understanding of the factors that influence the interpersonal relations of boys and men, I mean, literally, I mean, it's difficult to imagine a more vacuous statement. Next. Number five, guideline five. Psychologists strive to encourage positive father involvement and healthy family relationships. That's, that's certainly very true. But that exact statement holds true for also young girls. Uh, having uh, healthy relationships with one's father and having healthy family relationships is not something that is unique to masculinities, right? Uh, father absence, uh, Bruce Ellis, a good friend of mine who used to be at the University of Arizona and who's now at, I think, University of Utah, is the guru of exploring the relationship between father absence and menach, or, or in English, I think you say menarchy, which is the onset of the menstrual cycle. Uh, so a physiological reality of a little girl's body, in other words, when she first menstruates, turns out to be linked to whether there's a father that is 
present or absent in the home. So the relationship with one's father is not something that is uh, unique to boys and men. Uh, it, it is part of the fact that Homo sapiens are a biparental species uh, where you expect substantial involvement and investment of both men and women. Big deal. Number six, psychologists strive to support educational efforts that are responsive to the needs of boys and men. Now, this is one of the ones that actually I do find uh, valuable, uh, although, of course, uh, boys and girls have gone through formal education without needing to engage in sex-specific pedagogic uh, programs. Uh, you know, there is research that shows that the manner by, you know, boys ha have a hard time or a, on average a harder time to sit still and so on. So you might want to explore uh, specific realities, sex-specific realities that might uh, improve the pedagogic environment of young uh, boys and young men. Uh, so from that perspective, if you recognize that there might be some sex-specific differences, uh, which, by the way, those sex-specific differences are evolutionary-based, uh, then you might develop pedagogic intervention programs that target the specific sexes, and that seems reasonable to me. This is an example of a you know, mildly valuable insight, but most of the other guidelines uh, are pure, vacuous gibberish. Guideline seven, psychologists strive to reduce the high rates of problems boys and men face and act out in their lives, such as aggression, violence, substance abuse, and suicide. Uh, I mean, yes, of course, uh, men are much more likely to commit suicide than women globally, more than three to one. Uh, at least the, la the, the last data I had seen was three to one. Maybe it's a bit higher now. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, men are much more likely to uh, both commit violent crimes and be the victims of violent crimes. Men are much more likely to be homeless. Uh, so there are all sorts of sex-specific uh, epidemiological realities uh, that men are more likely to suffer from than women. Just life expectancy of men is much lesser. Men are the ones who are most likely to die from uh, occupational hazards and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, that's that's fine. And... Uh, Sure, if there is a way to uh, implement intervention strategies that can, uh, you know, reduce uh, these realities, great. But again, remember that I did a search on the report and the words biology, you know, almost never comes up. And when it does, it's in a completely throwaway manner. Evolution or evolutionary never came up. So socialization, privilege... Gender identity came up many, many times. Uh, evolution didn't come up. It's difficult to talk about male and female and never mention the word evolution once. Guideline eight, psychologists strive to help boys and men engage in health-related behaviors. Again, uh, no kidding. But the point is that Engaging in healthy behavior or promoting healthy behavior is something that is relevant to men, to women, to to to, uh, to every individual. The question becomes, are there sex-specific realities that cause specific disorders, specific maladaptive behaviors that to manifest themselves more with one sex than the other? And the only game in town, if you want to try to understand that, drum roll, you ready? Can you guess what that framework is called? It's called evolutionary psychology. So, for example, in the paper that I had published, I mentioned it earlier on OCD, I argued in that paper that there are certain forms of OCD that are much more likely to manifest themselves in men, other forms that are much more likely to manifest themselves in women, and other forms that are likely to be equally distributed across men and women. And the way that you would be able to predict, you know, where a particular manifestation of OCD would lie would be via evolutionary psychology. So if you wish to promote better health for men or women, then it's impossible to imagine how that would be the case without an evolutionary understanding of how sexual dimorphisms arise. So I published a paper uh, in 2006 with a dermatologist where we looked at the evolutionary roots of sun tanning. In that case, uh, women, single young women, are much more likely to engage in sun tanning behavior, even though... They are aware of the negative consequences of sun tanning much more than men are. 
So it's not because they don't know any better that they do it, and yet they still do it. Well, of course, there are evolutionary reasons why that particular behavior associated with uh, aesthetic cues would be more compelling to women. In several of my books, in two of my books, I talk about the Darwinian roots of dark side consumption, compulsive buying, eating disorders, pornographic addictions, pathological gambling. These particular forms of uh, maladaptive behaviors, which is very much within the purview of this particular report by the APA, th these behaviors manifest themselves in universally sex-specific ways. When it comes to pornographic addiction and pathological gambling, men suffer more. There is no culture where it's the other way around. When it comes to eating disorders and compulsive buying, women suffer more. So to the extent that not only do these phenomena manifest themselves in the exact same way across cultures, but also across time, Hippocrates uh, documented cases of eating disorders in exactly the same way as today. So the idea that it is due to the to media images is a breathtakingly moronic idea. But again, it's all facile theorizing. It's due to socialization. It's due to Hollywood images. It's due to the patriarchy. No, it's not. Most of these things are due to biology. Number nine. Psychologists strive to build and promote gender-sensitive psychological services. This is another one that I think is valuable and actionable to the extent that there might be sex-specific uh, differences in the manner by which men and women interact with therapists uh, in the likelihood of men seeking therapeutic help. We know that they're less likely to do so. Uh, then uh, exploring ways by which... Uh, interacting with men uh, in therapeutic contexts, that certainly seems to be valuable. Uh, so here's an example where a particular guideline is certainly uh, worthwhile exploring. But again, the problem stems from the fact that none of these uh, sex-specific realities are ever discussed in the report, as far as I can tell, uh, via the framework that matters more, which, as I've said now repeatedly, is the evolutionary lens. And finally, psychologists understand and strive to change institutional, cultural, and systemic problems that affect boys and men through advocacy, prevention, and education. This is what I call a grand BS statement. It means nothing. This is like when I satirize, you know, why does terrorism arise? Well, it's because of a ketogenic, paleobotanical, sociocultural, biosocial, and socio-anthropic uh, forces. So you just throw in a bunch of words so that it sounds like as though you're engaging in nuanced thinking, but it genuinely, literally means nothing. So let me read for you again guideline 10. Psychologists understand and strive to change institutional, cultural, and systemic problems that affect boys and men through advocacy, prevention, and education, also known as Boys and men might suffer from specific things, and we will do whatever we can to try to help them. Good night, everybody. It means nothing. So the problem with this report, number one, is that it does reek a bit of uh, social justice BS and social constructivism. There's a complete lack of uh, the evolutionary lens. You cannot study things like male and masculinities and femininity and uh, you know, female and so on without ever referring to what drives, what shapes these sex differences. Uh, the other problem is that, of course, a lot of the guidelines are so vacuous, are so broad that they mean uh, nothing. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so as I said, one or two of the guidelines seem reasonable, right? Uh, you know, having educational programs that are sex-specific and how they are Structured, seems reasonable. Uh, recognizing that there is a sex-specific difference in the manner by which men and women navigate through therapeutic services also seems reasonable. And the rest of the stuff, you can throw it out the window because it's worth almost nothing. Hope this has helped. Uh, I did uh, take off from my family to do this for you. If you appreciate the efforts that uh, uh, I go through to provide you with this content, uh, please consider supporting uh, my work. Uh, I know that many of you are upset with Patreon, but I still have a Patreon account. You could support me there. 
You could support me through uh, PayPal. Uh, you can also purchase uh, merchandise. You could see it at the bottom of the YouTube uh, video. You could mer uh, purchase merchandise via the Sad Truth uh, store. There you have it, folks. I hope you're having a good uh, Saturday. And I look forward to the number one comment uh, subsequent to me nourishing your souls and minds is, uh, Dr. Sad. Why do you blink so much? Have a good day, everybody. Cheers.